So throughout the PlayStation 3 generation, the system itself changed a lot. Like Sony revised the PlayStation 3 more than 25 different times with all kinds of model numbers that they went through and different form factors. We started with the very large $600 George Foreman grill and we ended up with, well, this guy right here. This is the PlayStation 3 4000 series and it is dubbed the Super Slim. Now I did pick this one up pretty recently and uh, it needs some cleaning. It's, it's kind of dirty and I have worked on several of these in my time, but it is probably the weirdest PlayStation 3 I've seen, mostly because it's so different from some of the previous models. When I say something's weird, I don't mean it's bad, but this one just stands out so much from the other PlayStation 3 consoles, and I wanted to kind of go through it here with you guys today. Enjoy these videos, make sure that like button helps out a ton, and if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. So the first thing to realize as Sony was going through that generation, they had to continue reducing the cost of the PlayStation 3, because when it launched, one of the biggest criticisms was how expensive it was. Sure, it had a ton of features packed in. It was able to play Blu-rays in 2006, which was a big deal, and it also was able to play the PS1 and the PS2 games immediately. In fact, it had hardware that was playing the PS2 games, so there was really no issue like we've had with the PS4 where you weren't able to play your PS3 games. The PS3 itself then was just a drop-in replacement for your PS2. But they realized they did have to reduce the cost if they wanted to continue selling more and more units. The PS3 wasn't exactly off and running with the 360 having a one-year head start. So as they went along, they very quickly started to reduce some of the features inside the system, most famously the PlayStation to backwards compatibility, and they eventually came out with that 40 gigabyte model that was not able to play PS2 games, but came in at about $400. And then eventually they got down to the Slim model at 300, and then they actually got this model here, the Super Slim, under $200, which was probably the strangest PlayStation 3 I've ever seen, and one that we worked on quite a bit at the store, because Sony, in order to get it under $200, basically removed the hard drive. They had 16 gigabytes of onboard flash memory where 12 gigabytes of it was usable and that was it. So you could install maybe one PlayStation 3 game and play it off of the internal flash memory. Now, there was still a slot on the side so you could install a hard drive, but it didn't come with a hard drive bracket. So we would end up having to order those quite often online. Fortunately though, you could just drop in a hard drive and the PS3 would format it and you're off and running. But that was the biggest thing. People were buying that 12 gigabyte model from places like Walmart that would have it on sale for like $160 and not realize that basically all the PS3 games you were buying had to install. Now, the biggest part about the PS3, especially when it released, is Sony went for a more premium feeling system, and they tried to maintain that throughout until they got to this one. This is certainly the cheapest feeling PlayStation 3. It's also the only PlayStation 3 that did not have a slot loading door for the disc. Instead, you would just slide it open like this, similar to what they had with the PS2 Slim where that would lift up and you drop the disc in and then close it. Now the sliding top wasn't really that big of a deal, but it did introduce its own problems, much like the slot loading door introduced its own problems where people would put different things inside of it, mostly kids, and they would jam different things in and kind of mess up the mechanism. This, when you open it up, obviously you are then exposing the laser to whatever wants to hit it. And you also have have to hope that people will at least be delicate with this door on top because that was another issue I'd run into. This would always be broken in some way to where it wasn't able to lock because as soon as it locks to the side, that's when the system knows to start reading a disc. Now this model that I have here is a 250 gigabyte PlayStation 3 Super Slim and once the side pops off here, we have access to our hard drive with the famous blue screw that comes out and then we can slide the entire tray out. And there we go, we have the 250 gigabyte Hitachi hard drive. And you can see there are a number of torque screws here. They're all security tipped, so you have to have a nice bit for that. And then we have some up here as well. And we'll have to be removing some of the plastics up here too. We also have several Phillips heads on the bottom here, some of which are covered up by like this warranty sticker or little plastic feet. Now I'm not a fan of the glossy plastic here. It always gets scratched up. No matter matter how much you try to protect it, unless you leave the plastic on, dust, anything really is going to scratch it, which is why I would have preferred them to just go all matte finish here. I know they were trying to go with like a two-tone design, but not the best decision. We did have one more screw right up here under the glossy plastic here, but once that comes out, 
should be able to lift up the entire lid just like this. And we can see quite a bit of dirt and dust and all kinds of stuff gets caught up here. And that's just because there's openings on the top here for everything to get into it. I, it does appear that Sony, what they were trying to do is kind of seal this off just from it being screwed down and not having a, a large, I guess, pathway in, but stuff still gets in pretty easily. And unfortunately the mechanism is right here. So, I mean, you could easily see this getting gummed up without too much trouble, but for the most part, the door itself, you can see it kind of slide and then it'll click over. You have an eject button that will essentially free it and allow it to kick over. But this right here was a mechanism that I would have to fight with a lot because if it doesn't click all the way over, it wouldn't signal to the system that it was shut so it wouldn't start reading. So sometimes people would bring their system in thinking that there was a problem with the laser when really it was just this door was not telling the system it was time to read. And a lot of that had to do with kind of just the cheap gears and different things they had going on up here where you could almost kick it out of whack just by sort of messing with it too much. I mean, you can see this guy kind of skipping around in here. So there were times where the gear itself will be chewed a little bit. It would have jumped over a spot and just sort of messed everything up and this wouldn't close all the way. So resetting these gears was uh, not fun at all, but I would end up doing it quite a bit. Now, the one thing I did like about this system is once you got the top off, it was pretty easy to do work on this system because everything was sort of right in front of you. Like the laser, just as an example, pretty much plugs in and then just lifts out. So, I mean, you can see all of it just kind of picks up here. You do have the ribbon cable kind of going underneath, but you can just unplug it and you can take the whole thing away. And I believe at one point they even sold these just completely like this. So if your laser was a problem, you could just buy the entire thing, unplug a few cables and you're good to go. The front power button was also plugged in, which is something that they had with the original PS3. Then they went away with that, I believe to save money and they just kind of located the power button on the board itself. And then they went back to with the slim model, but fortunately here, they stuck with their modular design for that power button. Couple of screws here and here and the whole power supply lifts off. Once again, a nice modular piece there, just in case system isn't powering up for you. And I do know some very light roach droppings here. Again, this was used, so uh, who knows how all of that happened there. But you guys think I was kidding when it comes to roaches in systems very common, uh, but I would find droppings quite often. It was just more on the rare side where I'd find any of them actually alive in the system. <laughs> you can all see our two Wi-Fi antennas up here and then they run down and around underneath this hard drive cage and they plug into the board here. I'm gonna go ahead and unplug those because we are going to be taking the board out. I also wanna point out that in order to save costs, Sony did a lot of little things here as well. For example, I just removed these two silver screws and they go through this cage here onto the other side where the plastic is. By making this part here part of the case, they were able to remove one of those brackets where typically in the previous PS3 systems, they'd have two brackets, just be able to cut that in half does save money when they're mass producing these systems. Again, kind of the little things to save money. Anyway, with that done, the whole bottom casing will move to the side and then we could take a look at the board. And you just get dust bunnies all over the place um, with some of these systems, especially PlayStation 3s for some reason. I would see dust bunnies constantly, but if you remember the PS3 itself would get pretty loud at time and it was pushing air through pretty small spaces. This system, however, uh, was the smallest they were able to get the fabrication down for the RSX chip and the cell, which means the system itself was very power efficient and it ran pretty cool. Now you can see our single bracket here. As I said, they were able to eliminate one of them by having the screws go through the casing on the other side. I will remove this and then we can remove the shielding and take a look at the cell and the RSX. So here's our motherboard and this is pretty cool. So I was trying to figure it out if we would get lucky and get one of these boards. This is an NPX001, which means this should have the smallest fabrication for the RSX chip that Sony was able to achieve, which was 28 nanometers. See, when you bought these, you were kind of getting a roll of the dice. It was either gonna be 40 nanometers for the RSX or 28. And for the most part, it really didn't make a lot of difference. People did power tests on them and it turns out it was negligible in terms of efficiency and power draw, but this should be a very weird looking RSX chip and it is, you can see it right here. Typically when we see these RSX chips, they have four different memory modules on it and it's a slightly larger die right in the middle, 
but because of how small the fabrication is, you can see the chip itself is much smaller and they even only have two memory modules on here, which is kind of interesting. Now I can tell you for the most part, I never really had to work on the RSX or the cell for this model of the PlayStation 3. Some of that may have had to do with this system coming out like months before the PS4. This was in 2012. So not a lot of people were probably even buying these necessarily. They may have been holding off for the PS4. And then even when these broke, the people probably thought, well, it's the old system now. I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and just get the PS4. So they didn't even think to bring them in for repair. But I can tell you for the most part, mechanically speaking, when it comes to the motherboard, this is pretty sound, which I'm sure had to do with Sony not having to fight the onslaught of power and heat that was generated from their original PlayStation 3 system, which yeah, would get quite hot and pull a lot of power. But still, the fact that they were able to create this RSX chip on this board with very minimal cooling. I mean, we've we've gone over the heat sinks and how massive they were and what they had to try to do with those big turbine fans and those older PlayStation 3 systems. But I mean, take a look at this. That's legitimately the heat pipe that they have for the RSX. They just have this one copper heat pipe running around here and then it's cooled on the other side with this tiny little heat sink. Like that's it. And then they have this aluminum fin set up here. That's for the cell chip that's directly next to it. So after all of that, all the stuff they had to deal with with the previous ones, we got to a point where technology advanced and they were able to do these very, very small fabrications on the RSX chip, making it way more efficient and uh, much easier to cool. Which is why I think it's a shame that we didn't get this kind of setup in one of the slim PlayStation 3 systems before this. See, with that slot loading door and the efficiency they, they were able to achieve with the cell and this RSX, it would've been a really nice PS3 to own. But unfortunately we have what really is the best setup here when it comes to the board being hampered by what was probably the cheapest setup with that mechanical sliding door. But I will say if you're someone who's able to uh, keep your systems in good shape, or maybe you're someone who doesn't really care about the physical side of things when it comes to the PlayStation 3, and you mostly just want to play digital games and you want a quiet system that's pretty efficient, this would be the one to get. So overall, an interesting revision, certainly the weirdest PlayStation 3 that Sony has made, but uh, that's not always a bad thing. Let me know what you guys think though about the PlayStation 3 Super Slim. I have a lot of work to do here cleaning this one up. There's a, a lot of dust and all kinds of stuff going on here. So I'm gonna get to work on that one. Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.